it reads, is the Lord's and everything in it, the world exactly. But at the same time, we are reminded of creation on a weekly basis. Like today, which is a Sabbath, really we are being reminded about creation. The war that Satan has waged against, and he continues to do so, against the true Sabbath is meant to create an impression or a false impression that God is the creator. God matic. But David was different. David was different. A king, noble, powerful, but he recognized that God, the true God, is the creator. Just to remind us again that indeed God is the creator and owner of everything, and not only the earth, but everything including you and me. And there me add, including everything in you and me, and there are many things that you walk around with, your eyes, your ears, your hands, your legs, the heart, the brain, and many, many more. And if you want, you can still go granular. You can go even smaller, okay, and start talking, you know, about the muscles and so on. The smaller, smaller thing, the muscles in your hand. You know you can have a hand without a muscle, you will not be able to do anything. You can have a leg without the muscle, it will not be able to, to function. Friends, just be reminded that God created these body parts in us for a purpose, which is collectively, all of them, really, they, they are meant to contribute to glorifying him, our God. Sadly, though, some of these organs, the hands, the eyes, the ears, the mouth, all those, okay, in our bodies, can actually negatively influence the way we behave and do things. They can negatively influence our actions. Friends, we live in a world where the greatness and sovereign of God the creator of the heavens and the earth is downplayed by our actions, what we do. Sadly, to the extent of which people are in competition to aim to own this and that. And you know, people are running around, you know, to try and own things as if they are the creator. God created this world in, and it's fixed. There's nothing you are going to add to it or subtract from it. God created it and it's enough. But you are running around looking for things that are not even there. And that's what... You know, uh, Solomon calls vanity. And the sad reality is that in the process of running around to look for this and that, to enrich yourself, to gather things here and there, you run at a risk of losing sight of God as the creator. And therefore, when David reminds us through the inspired word of the creator of the heavens and earth, he knows. We should know. I want us to go to our verses and I want us to look again in more detail Psalms 24 verse 3. Psalms 24 verse 3. And even as I go there, just remember God is the creator. Remember about those hands. Remember about those legs. Remember about those eyes, those ears, the mouth, and any other organs that God has given you. Just remember about them as we go through this. From NIV, Psalms 24 verse 3, again just to read, it says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his presence? Good people, we do have real, and at times imaginary mountains or hills in the world, or even in our country here. Specifically in this country, we have known mountains like Mount Kenya. I don't know how many of you have ever seen it. I want to believe most Kenyans have not known where Mount Kenya is. Maybe they know, but they have never been, been there. We also have Mount Elgon. I don't know how many have been there, okay? Uh, me, I've been there, but I've not climbed, okay? The same with Mount Kenya, but I've not climbed. But I know a few people here 
who have climbed Mount Kenya. We have Mount Longonot, and all these mountains are really attractive, okay, and appealing. And people will wish to ascend those mountains to enjoy the scenery, you know, while at the top. You know that scenery, it's about creation. It's God. These beautiful things, you know, that is God's creation. Okay, as you enjoy them, remember the creator. We also have Ngong Hills. The Ngong Hills that are near here. Those ones who have not been there, you can, you can go there and enjoy I don't know how many of these mountains you have climbed, but for me, I'll tell you that I've climbed one mountain. And the mountain I've climbed is Mount Longonot. I don't know how many of you have been to Mount Longonot. I conquered this mountain long, long time ago, in 1973, when I was in Form 1, and I was a Boy Scout. That's when I conquered it. I don't know when you conquered that mountain. Okay? So before some of you were born, that mountain had been conquered already. Okay? By one Tom Omurua. Well, <laughs> friends, so we also have imaginary mountains, such as uh, we had during the last campaign. You remember the political campaigns of 2022 last year? It's just, it just like that campaign never ended. Okay? It's, it's like it's been a continuous thing up to now. But if you remember, we, we used to hear phrases like, whoever will climb the mountain will garner the most votes and become the winner of the political contest. I, I, I think you can remember that, okay? That the mountain is the one which was going to determine who will become president in this country, and therefore there was that clamor to try and climb that imaginary mountain. And then I would hear certain phrases like, the mountain has become slippery. You remember, the mountain has become slippery, and then like some people are trying to get to the mountain, but they cannot be able. But friends, these are not the mountains we are talking about today. Okay? Uh, for those ones, we know who can ascend. Those slippery mountains of the politics, we know who can ascend. If you have enough money, a lot of money, you can buy your way to the top of that imaginary mountain. That is another story. You can deal with that, okay? But that's not what we are talking about today. But in the Bible, we have several verses where the mountain has been mentioned. And I want just to look at two of them because of time. Uh, the first one is Exodus 24, verse 12. Exodus 24, verse 12. Um, and it says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain, and remain there. And I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. This is a mountain. We know it's Mount Sinai. We know it's real. We know that it's there. There are people when they go to Israel, they usually, they usually climb that mountain. Right? So it's something real. There is also mention of a mountain in Isaiah Chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. I won't read that because of time, but you can read it. Okay? And the last one I want to share is Psalms 121, verse 1 and 2, which reads, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. All these verses may have different meaning depending on the context but there's something that is common in these verses. It's about God. Where to find God. Not literally, okay? Not literally because I don't think you're going to meet God somewhere and face. You can't. I mean, we are too sinful to be able to face, face God. Literally. But it is symbolic of that. And it's more specifically about God's presence. So friends, the mountain or the hill of the Lord represents some higher spiritual ground. It represents some higher spiritual ground which brings us closer to God. It is a state of spirituality 
A hill or a mountain also often symbolizes the temple. And you can find this in the Bible. Like I mentioned in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2, you will be able to see that. It symbolizes a temple. But one thing that we need to bear in mind that when you climb a hill for the first time, um, it may seem difficult. But if you climb the hill regularly, regularly, you become stronger and better able to handle the climb. The same applies of increasing our spirituality. I don't know what you and me are doing to strengthen ourselves so that we can be able to ascend into the hill of the Lord. It needs practice. It needs effort. You have to work for it. It's not something that can just happen. Okay? Otherwise, then, like the politicians say, it can become slippery. And we don't want things to become slippery for us. So the question still remains in verse 3. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? This particular verse, this verse actually presupposes that there are people who may have difficulty or may not be able to ascend the mountain of the Lord. It presupposes that. And therefore, unable to stand in God's presence. which as the, people, as the Bible says, is a holy place. So there are some people who may have difficulty. And that's what this verse presupposes. And it's about living the right, having the right relationship with our creator. So to address this question, who will ascend the mountain of the Lord? Is it you? Is it me? Or is it both of us? I want us to look at some factors that may determine the one who the Bible says can ascend the mountain of the Lord and be in his presence. And the answer is in Psalms 24, verse 4 and 5. I want to look to just go through that and then I will be able to expound. The one who has clean hands, that's verse 4, he says, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not trust an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from their God, from God their Savior. Friends, I want just to, to address four characteristics as we close. Four characteristics that are critical for one to ascend the mountain of God. The first one. The one who has clean hands. The one who has clean hands is the one who will ascend. Look at your hands. Look at your hands. Those ones who have hands. Are they clean? Maybe you washed them this morning and therefore you, you may think they are clean. That's okay. But this is what that speaks to. So this clean hands speaks of a man or a woman who is pure in both their actions and hands are about actions and remember I said God created the hands okay the hands are supposed to be used for his glory but we misuse these hands to do other things that don't glorify God in fact we use these hands to do things that cause us to sin So who are these? They are such as, in other people, such as keep themselves from all the gross acts of sin, those ones who avoid sin. They are not spotted with the pollution of the world and the flesh. And the pollution of the world and the flesh, there's a long list. This morning, I think the word corruption, corruption has been mentioned more than three times. In my class, I think it was mentioned. And also during the prayer session, I had it. But there are certain things, friends, that pollute us, okay? Including theft and extortion. And this is very rampant in our settings, by the way. People are thieves. You see people here? People are thieves. They steal money in their offices where they work, okay? And so on. There's a lot of extortion that is happening in this world. Corruption. Who are the perpetrators of corruption? Do they go to church? Yes, they do. They come here. The corrupt are also in church. The corrupt get money and they bring it to church as tithe. 
And they are there. And yet they are polluted. Are you coming here with clean hands? Are you in the presence of the Lord? We have adultery. Adultery is another big one. But that one is usually hidden. But some studies have been conducted and they show that it exists. And it's rampant in many places in this world. The issue of pornography. Pornography, I'm sure this is the elephant in the house. People may think that it's not a big problem, but I will tell you it's a big problem even in this church among the young people and even the old people. It is polluting our hands, polluting our actions. Last year, I had a young man who testified in that tent to me. He told me how he has been struggling with pornography, 12 years old. In this church, 12 years old. And he told me, he could even tell me the sites that he visits. Phonography is a big problem in the church and out there. What do we watch on TV, YouTube, Facebook, and other media? Yes, that battle you have in the house about the remote control. People are fighting to sin. The war on the remote is who, is, who wants to sin more? Continue fighting with that, for that remote, okay? And see the winner in sinning. So they that hold cleanness of con conversation, they that uphold justice, these are the people that, whose hands can be clean. Friends, hands, hands that are lifted up in prayer must be pure hands that are devoid of any of the things mentioned above. If you are involved in any of the things I've mentioned, then your hand is not clean. Okay? And I want to believe that there are many of us. These things are offensive to the Holy One. The second point. The one who has a pure heart. The one who has a pure heart. This speaks of a man or a woman who is pure in their, in their intention. Those ones who are pure in their intention. The intention is about the heart. Okay? The intentions. You know the heart is the one that controls what you do. Alright? The heart, according to the Bible, is part of a man's spiritual makeup. It is the place where emotions and desires begin. It is that which drives the will of man. Hence, it means the mind, the soul, spirit, or one's entire emotional nature and understanding. It's important as Christians to know that our actions come from the things we think and believe. If you have the right beliefs in our heart, our actions will be right giving and we will move in the right direction. When our heart is right and pure, we can obey God's word and apply it in our life. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23, we can go there, reads that above all else, Proverbs 4 verse 23 reads, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And also, as we go to Mark chapter 7, verse 20 to 23. Mark chapter 7, verse 20 to 23. It reads, he went on, and this is Jesus. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual morality, theft that we mentioned about, murder, adultery that we mentioned about, greed, malice, deceit, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Therefore, who can ascend the Lord's mountain? Who can ascend the Lord's mountain? They that are not pretenders. They who are inwardly as good 
as they seem to be outwardly, they have pure hearts. You know, there are people who, okay, Wangalia from outside, they are so holy, but inside, my friend, they are terrible. Okay? And such pretenders are there. And there are many. But they do come to church. We worship together. We rejoice together. But such who pretend may have difficulty ascending the mountain of the Lord. Number two, on that particular aspect, they that uphold high levels of qualities such as integrity, honesty, and moral impurity, I think we mentioned that, they that are truthful, sincere, and genuine of mind, heart, and soul. Those are the people who can ascend the hill of the Lord. My friend, you cannot be in the presence of the Lord with that kind of baggage. You can't. Okay? God is too holy for you to just be around him with that baggage. Okay? And therefore, it becomes difficult. It is a mountain because it's a difficult thing. And I know that some of these habits, getting rid of them is not an easy thing. As we close, we look at that. The third point, the one who does not trust an idol. The one who does not trust an idol. During David's time, idolatry, idolatry just like it is today, was rampant and a big problem not only in the neighboring kingdoms but also within Israel. Idolatry is a worship of someone or something other than God as so it was God. The kingdoms during those days, David's time, had their gods that they trusted so much. Church, are there persons or things that we trust so much to the extent that they to the extent that they mask us from seeing the true God? Do we have such? We concentrate so much on those things that they actually mask us from seeing the true God who is the creator of heaven and earth. Which are some of these? Because these are the things that become idols in our lives. We watch them indirectly. Let's just mention a few. Money, pesa, material things can be an idol depending on where we have placed them in our lives in relation to God, the creator of heaven and the earth. The problem here is people, people pursue money so much or acquiring things so much to the extent that it becomes an idol. It's not bad looking for money. Yes, but let it not be the major focus, okay? There are people who just sleep thinking about, they sleep, they dream about money, how to make the money, and they wake up thinking about making more money. You know? If, if that's the kind of life you are leading, whereby you go to bed and it's about money, you come in the morning, you wake up, it's about money. Then money, as much as it's a good thing, okay, is becoming an, an idol in our lives. So it's how you view the money that is a problem. Okay? It's not having it. If you're making your money, genuinely, you're doing your business, God is blessing you, and you are making that money, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? But let it not be something that becomes an obsession in our lives. Okay? Like, for example, you may be having a business that is running today, but you are in church. Okay? Then that business becomes an idol. You know? Let us not place too much, man, too much hope in the money in our meetings. Let's trust God more. And God will be able to bless us with that money. But again, it's not, it's not just about having money for it to be an idol. It's not that you must have it. There are people who don't have money and still money becomes, and, and yet money becomes an idol. They are there, you know. Somebody doesn't have it, but is craving, is struggling to have it. You don't have it, but you are really struggling to have it. Then it can also become an idol as much as you don't have it. Okay? And so on. So very quickly, we have got jobs and the status 
uh, I know jobs. Uh, if somebody, this, somebody threatened with sucking you, you will just sulk, okay? You will, you will tremble, you know? Your life will be threatened, okay? And, and that, that is because that job has become an obsession. It has become an idol in your life. Such that if somebody pulls it away, then you feel as if now the world has gone, you know, blank. Jobs. And status. Don't put too much trust on the jobs. It's God who gave you. If it goes, it's okay. God will give you another one. Okay? But don't panic. Okay? There are people cling to certain jobs so hard, even if they are getting frustrated, they don't just want to leave because they feel that if they leave it, then they are going to die. Okay? They will have a financial collapse in their life. No. It's not. If you are such a person, then you know that slowly that, a job, that job is becoming an obsession. One of these days, they'll, come, they'll ask you to come and uh, work on Sabbath, and I'm sure you will accept to do so. I've also been in job for a long time. I, I, I just retired four years ago, three years ago. But I was in job for many years, over 35 years. Uh, a lot of the time I was in the NGO world. But I had an, an, a time when I got sacked. Uh, this was in 2009. Actually, I was asked to resign. The camp meeting of 12, 2009, I was here. And uh, while I was attending the camp meeting, I was called back to the office in Westlands. And then my boss told me, resign. In his office, he just told me to resign. He gave me a piece of paper. And I was asking him why. He just say to resign. And uh, prior to that, I had asked for leave to come to the camp meeting. I, he, didn't, he didn't accept. So what I did, I just filled the forms and left them. Then I came to the camp meeting. I was here, out here. Then I was called and I was told to resign. In fact, I resigned very fast. I resigned very fast and then I came back to continue with my camp meeting. I didn't care, all right? I knew I was losing a job. I told my wife uh, happiness about it, but that is it. I, 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 didn't, I didn't even beg to remain. I just said, okay, I put two paragraphs of resignation. I came back, and I was here until the camp meeting was over. But you know what happened after that? Before the camp meeting was even over, I had... Many consultancies, people calling me for consultancy work. I was extremely busy doing consultancies and making even more money than the salary that I was, you know, I was getting in that employment. To the extent that some organization thought that they were giving too much money for consultancy, so they offered me a job. I said, it's okay. Give it to me. And I worked, there for, I worked there for nine years. No, 11 years. That's where I retired from. So, friends, let us not be obsessed with jobs. If somebody threatens you with, that you're going to lose your job, say it's okay. After all, it's God who provides and it's God who can take it away anytime. The other point that I need to mention, the issue of technology, the phones that you are having, uh, technology, smartphones, we are so much addicted to them to the extent that as soon as you come out of here, I'm sure there are others who are looking at it right now, but as soon as you come out of here, the first thing you're going to do is get your mobile phone, isn't it? You want to check who has checked on you, okay? How many messages have you received? That's an obsession. And if you are not careful, you will get addicted, and then it will become an idol in our, in our lives. I know it's getting out of hand, especially, actually, it's a cross board. It's not just about the young people. It's everyone now. People are so obsessed. And if you don't want to believe, just, just go to your settings, eh? Not now, okay? Later on, go to your settings, okay? And just check on screen time, all right? The screen time. It will tell you how much time you actually spend, okay? Guessing at that, at that screen. Then you know that you are putting so much time on that and you are getting actually obsessed, all right? And these things are becoming a modern-day idol. They are, and we have to be very careful. We have to struggle and see how to get around, around that. Okay? I know it's a big, big problem. 
So, just talking about phones, I just want to say that uh, at the heart of it, it's not about the phones or social media or any form of technology. It's the value we place on it that makes it a problem. Okay? I, I want to believe that if you forget your phone in the house, you will go back. Ataka momenda mbali utarudi. Okay? Why? I know you're going to say because it's money nowadays, it's in person and so on. But then, just be careful that we don't get obsessed. Okay? So, when our lives revolve around how many likes we get, uh, what our following looks like, or if we can't sit in silence for five minutes without refreshing our news feed, you know, all that, we might have an idol. And this is just caution. So, the others are entertainment. I wouldn't elaborate that. The issue of comfort, the issue of sex, let me not even elaborate on that. Children and family, they can become idols. The first of the biblical commandments uh, is very clear. You shall have no other gods before for me. So, who may ascend? The mountain of the Lord. One, they who have been accepted by God, who reject idolatry of any form, both by actions and also in their souls. They that do not set their affections upon the things of this world. They that do not lift up their souls into vanity. You know, we are chasing a lot of things that are meaningless. They that have no affinity for the praise of men. <laughs> I don't want to go there much. You know politics. And you see how... Politicians are being followed around. <sighs> you just wonder. People are literally worshipping politicians. Why? Because they want jobs, they want money. Out of it, money that is ill-gotten, and so on. And lastly, the one who does not swear by a false god. The one who does not swear by a false god. The words we speak are a good indication of the state of our heart the inner man or woman. One who makes deceptive promises finds no welcome from God. The ones to ascend to the Lord's mountain and be go at God's presence are, one, they who are honest, and I mentioned about that. We know that the levels of dishonesty in this world and even in this church are alarming. I know, in this church, there are people who borrow money from others, but they never return. But they promise you, they promise you they are going to return the following day. You never get to see it. The next thing, you know, when they see you here in these uh, streets that we have in here, you find them just disappearing and, you know, dishonesty. Okay? Why borrow money and you don't repay? Okay? That's just a, an example. And it happens in this church. They, in their covenant with God, their contracts with men, they have not sworn deceitfully, nor broken their promises, violated their engagements, nor taken any false oath. And they that have regard the obligations of truth or the honor of God's name. So friends, as I conclude, children of the Most High, God desires all his children to have unrestricted access to his, pres his presence. God wants us. That's why he told the children of Israel, make this so that I can be in your presence. Okay? But it's up to us to make that choice to be in God's presence. And God did this, and that's why he allowed his only son, Jesus Christ, to come and face such a shameful death on the cross so that you and me can confidently approach the throne. Remember the death on the cross is the one that removed that wedge that was between us and God that was created because of sin. That is the love that we have from God. Psalms 24 verse 7 reads, Lift up your heads, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Friends,
for us to be in the presence of the Lord, we need to open the doors to our hearts that the Holy Spirit may dwell in us. He, the helper, would navigate us against the trappings of the devil. All those things that we talked about, that we are struggling with, pornography, adultery, theft, corruption, mention them. I know it's difficult once we get addicted to certain things. Once it becomes a habit, it's so deep, it becomes difficult to get out of it. With our own effort, it becomes difficult. And that's we need the Holy Spirit to be able to guide